Welcome to the Resign Worship Songwriting Podcast, episode 28. This is an interview special with Jeremy Perigo. Jeremy, it's a pleasure to welcome you to our podcast. Thanks. It's yeah, it's fantastic to be here. I've really enjoyed the bits that I've heard from your yeah from the last few you've done, and it's cool to be here. Oh, good. We always like to interview somebody who's heard some of our work. Um, you are the um, director of music and worship programs at London School of Theology. Um, maybe just straight up for the kind of the uninitiated, give us a bit of an idea of what is London School of Theology and what is the director of music and worship programs. What's that involve? Yeah, London School of Theology's. Um, uh, yeah, Center for Theological Study. You can go all the way from just short courses all the way to your bachelor's up to PhD level training in theology. And that's been around for, it's, the school's been around about 75 years. Um, in the midst of that, about 20 years ago, some pioneers launched a program in theology, music, and worship. Um, and that's really an integration of, of those three, you know, kind of broad worship studies, practical worship leadership. Um, musical studies up to those who have professional training and also we now have a pathway for those who are, who have really had lots of intuitive training and then within within the we're studying within that um, the context of theological studies so trying to have worship leaders and musicians who have a robust theology and understand how theology is made and be able to critique their tradition and also gain and critique from um, other traditions too so I lead um, two bachelor's programs, Theology, Music, and Worship, and Theology and Worship, and then teach on quite a few of the other degrees we have here on MA and PhD level. Some might imagine that um, worship, pure worship, and pure academia are a sort of odd bedfellows. I don't know, is it a common, is it a common course around the world, or is this quite, quite unique? It's, yeah, I think it's, it's growing within Protestant and evangelical traditions, and I think for for those of us that come from that evangelical tradition, there is a, a huge value for a heartfelt experience and heartfelt expression in worship. But I think now, de- depending on when you define the start of evangelicalism, the, I think it's more worship leaders are becoming thoughtful and understanding, yes, we need to express our hearts, but also our expression as a community does form the life of our congregation. So yes, we do need to express our love for Jesus, but also recognizing that these songs we write, these prayers we pray, the sermons we preach do form the life of our congregation. And so just wild expression uh, in and of itself and into itself may not um, be something that we want to pass on to our children without recognizing their there is there is formation happening in that, and there is theolo- theology is is being uh, expressed in the midst of that too. And um, you're obviously now, you know, as a head of department, you are a kind of you're a bona fide academic, um, and I'm, I'm just interested in your route to that. You know, did you set out from high school to pursue a career in academia, or how have you found your way there? Yeah, I I I I didn't. I think my my journey is. Um, it seems random, although now looking back, I can see God's God's hand and direction in the midst of that. I, from from high school, which I was very involved in worship and music and recording. I'm a first study saxophonist, so playing lots in kind of gospel bands and kind of modern worship groups, which had lots of saxophone there in the '90s, which was great for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, from that, I actually did a, a business degree, a BS in management, but did loads of music, loads of recording. I think at one point in, in uni, I was in 13 or 14 bands, wow. jazz bands, or you know, symphonic orchestras, lots of different worship bands. Um, and, th- and through that, I always sensed a call to to vocational ministry and serving God by serving, you know, the church. And mm. so that led to doing an MA in practical theology at Regent University in Virginia Beach. And from there, I started doing loads of cross-cultural mission. Um, I started working part-time as a youth and worship pastor. And then and then the other part-time was traveling the world, helping mm. um, different churches, different denominations um, gain a better understanding of worship, but then also understanding in their their context how what does that look like how what does song look like what does preaching and prayer and and look like and so um that led to i did that about five six years that led to living in turkey cross-culturally um with my wife and starting a starting a family there and 
that that was a brilliant experience, um, and we're still really connected there. But a chance to kind of understand what does the church look like at a really pioneering context. Um, mm. The pro- Protestant church there, depending on who you read, there's very few people even reflecting on that. But is maybe 50 years, maybe 100 years old. So in the midst of that, there's about three three to five thousand. Um, Turkish believers that would consider themselves Protestants wow. or evangelicals. Yeah. And so really exciting place to look at worship and culture and music and, um, you know, identity in the midst of that. Yeah. So I got a doctorate while I was there reflecting on that. Um, and then that really, that experience and that time really led to working here at LST. And I think my weird mix of yeah. music, music, jazz, theology, mission culture yeah. um somehow made yeah they, somehow they liked that in my cv and up, <laughs> the two, i think i think here. they just liked your accent maybe that was it <laughs> we're easily swayed um, i'm interested in you were talking about the the evangelical church in in turkey um is it like it can be in, in quite a lot of places where it's a fairly young evangelical church that actually there's no real distinction with Pentecostal evangelical often it's sort of the same kind it's all one, one mix is that the the I think I think we've we I've been connected there probably now 12 years and I yeah. would say I would say initially I think whether that was my own naivety or or really what was happening at that time I, I'm not I'm still not quite sure but I would say there's there's less of that distinction but that yeah. definitely that definitely exists and especially when you're maybe to the the individual you know churchgoer individual worshiper the, that distinction might not be there but definitely to those who are leaders of the church they recognize that um, maybe they were supported by a Presbyterian church yeah. or they you know initially met the Lord through a, a you know charismatic YWAM group and so those those distinctions are a part of their life and a part of their leadership and were a part, you know instrumental in their own formation so I think um, not maybe not always in the title of the church like it, yeah. it is here but definitely in the kind of undergird undercurrent of of the church and its life and there's you know there's charismatic church there's non-charismatic there's those that have baptists there's those right, yeah. um but but i think quite a few of them would just say we're evangelical in the in the kind of british british sense not the, not the, <laughs> not the american it's sense a bit but, different, isn't it? you know yeah. we scripture is important to us and it's yeah. our priority and evangelism is important and i think especially in a context like that it's it's always um fantastic to see the church being bold in its faith and its love for Jesus and sharing that even when it's the minority, you know, when yeah. it is the min- minority uh, tradition there. Let's talk about um, indigenous expressions of worship, because I know that's something obviously you've worked with a number of churches on. It's important to you. Um, and I'd love to explore. I'd love to hear lots about it. One of the things that immediately occurs to me is, is instantly, is it a is it a worship priority or a mission priority? Do you, can you can you can you divide up the two, or is it just a fusion of both that makes that indigenous expression so important? I think for for me, yeah, it is. I I you know being at LST, I think even has helped me understand integration. And I think in the church and in, in our church life and practical ministry, I do understand the necessity to segment and give titles and give you know we we. we we have missions classes here. We have theology classes. We have practical music classes. But for me, I think those two things are so um, interconnected, mission and, and worship and missiology and mm. liturgical studies. And I think it's difficult to to be completely transcultural in our worship. I think all of our worship has culture embedded, whether we're whether it's fifth century Byzantine or whether it's, you know, 1980s vineyard, you know, so, Southern California, there's cultural um, expressions in in the midst of that. Um, you know, Tom, I think it's Tom Wright's quote of, you know, worship, worship is on our knees before the beloved and, and mission is walking out the door with, you know, for the beloved. So both yeah. of that relates to relational dynamic and and an active posture. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> And because worship brings well, forms of worship so often carry with them a cultural form, yeah. it's, it's ever so easy to to just import that, isn't it, to whatever yeah. your situation is. Um, what kind of ways have you then have you gone about um, trying to bring it back into something that's more a natural cultural expression? Yeah, I think the 
the two dangers that I've I've seen are the two extremes, and I'm again that integration in me or that desire to find the the middle pathway. I think one extreme is, um, yeah, that exportation. That oh wow, uh, you know this this Hillsong song or this this you know free church liturgy is going to be amazing. It works really well in, at a conference of twenty five thousand people. So let's let's do that. And then that that's small churches in Turkey or that's yeah. you know, north churches in Northwest London. Yeah. Um, the other extreme is, and this is what I've, what I, my, my doctoral research has kind of tried to explore. The other extreme is coming and saying, and now many Western missionaries come and say, your worship isn't Turkish or your worship isn't Indonesian. Um, and what you've been singing for the last 30 years or 50 years or 100 years isn't a cultural expression. So please stop singing that right, yeah. and start and start singing indigenous expressions. Yeah. And I think that extreme, too, is reverse colonialization. It's the exact opposite of its same motivation. It, it can it can be an, uh, understood in the same yeah. way, um, but it, it, it is can be quite dangerous. And a friend of mine at a, a well-meaning conference said, it feels like everyone is shoving the saws down my throat. And he's an acoustic guitar player, loves modern worship that, you know, and also loves to write his own songs. And so my middle ground is to try to help people recognize th those two tendencies. And, yeah. and also on a localized level, let's, let's be discerning in, in our song choices. And then I think contexts like Turkey and, um, you know, parts of Eastern Europe, parts of Africa that that don't have a rich tradition of, of songwriting, of just encouraging them, uh, encouraging them to write localized songs that mm. um, reflect their life. And so for one of my friends in Istanbul, he's pulling from jazz, hip hop, you know, a little yeah. bit of country and traditional folk music from Turkey and, and things like that. So I think it recognizes um, our own diverse musical identities, which is fairly true for for most of us around the world that there is not that it would be hard to say i have one personal musical identity and then when yeah. you think about your when you think about a congregation too um so trying to push against the homogeneous nature of our global worship traditions and the dominant forms trying to push against that but also trying to not simply say oh well one time i saw this video and I've I've explored this particular style of, of Turkish folk music, and so I'm going to define an entire culture, which yeah. f features dozens of tribal groups and dozens of musical identities, yeah. and try to define it that way either. So I think there's, it's a little more complex, it's a little more gray area, yeah. but but trying to empower and encourage local congregations to make those decisions for themselves. We, we like to pigeonhole, don't we? I think. There's maybe some, just something human about it. We're, we're looking at a different culture. We always think well, I can pretty much summarise that one. But my culture is diverse, but yours is yours is narrow, and I'm sure it's really easy to do. Um, I, I was thinking of the difference, the, the, the contrast between worship colonisation and colonialism, where the colonisation yeah. is going and, and imposing, and the colonialism is is imposing your superior view, isn't it? Yeah. Which is actually that second thing, and I I found that what you said so helpful it's quite easy to to dismiss something as derivative or as um not yeah i guess not original enough or not indigenous enough and yeah. so on. but that in itself is a that's a colonialism isn't it yeah and i think when it comes down to practice even for you and i and local churches in the uk or if i'm back in the states is to try to come in first when I'm doing an event or conference or something with a listening ear and what's what's really going on in your local church and um, and I think that is where the skills of a missiologist are helpful or a, you know an anthropologist or sociologist are helpful where you can come in thinking okay here's what is this context what 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 do they think they need? What yeah. do I think they need? <laughs> yeah. And probably somewhere in the middle <laughs> there is yeah. is what really we should try to be in, encouraging in this season. Of course, of course, spiritual answer also. What is God? What is God speaking yeah. in, in that in that moment too? And I think that that is where we often probably find failures, both in conferences, events, training. Um, is our perception of the need is coming in, um, whether that's dropping into a country or dropping into a church we're unfamiliar with, or even what 
some of the congregations think they need. So I think a, a key thing is dialoguing and trying to yeah. create create conversation that explore and have have some teaching, but have some prodding. So in Turkey, that meant drinking lots of tea, lots of chai right. with, Tur- with Turkish leaders and trying to share my heart, their heart, and 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 yeah. from that, seeing some training events and, and resources yeah. Um, emerge. Yeah, I, I mean, we've talked about songs being imported. Um, have you seen, in some of those contexts, have you seen songs being exported and, and then going wider than that situation? Or is that something even, you know, is that something we should um, aspire to? Or is that or perhaps that's just a byproduct that may or may not happen? I think, I mean, here at LST, that's something we've been trying to experiment with. Um, one, because of our diverse student body that has students from all over the globe that one represents London but then we have loads of international students who come for PhD for a few years or for undergrad for a couple years Um, is trying to what are some of the songs from from these cultures that we can export import into you know into into our context and of course language is a huge challenge Um, you know translating from yeah, tur- Turkish to English for a song is quite quite difficult, or Arabic to English. Have you um, done that? Have you have you been involved in a, that? A little bit. Um, what what I've done when we've done some of these these times here is actually sing the song and try to sing it in its original context, yeah. and then have a prayer based. You know, while the music and melodies played on another instrument, have a prayer based on on the text. Okay. Um, yeah. There's re- uh, resonance, which is connected with WEC, is a great great group that does translate some of these to English and they have a lot of resources and they they lead an ethnomusicology workshop here that we do and so it yeah. gives student students about 10 to 15 songs after about three days from Turkey Indonesia North Africa um, you know China East, and other parts of East Asia and so those, a couple of those are there's a one that comes from Pakistan that's brilliant I mean it has has a Bollywood vibe to it yeah. but but you can yeah, the the Hindi words are easy enough to to pick up, and then there's also some English English. And the, versions, the Bollywood so. vibe, I guess, is quite culturally translatable nowadays, isn't it? It's a it's a it's a, it's a big enough. I mean, it's a well known yeah. cultural expression. Yeah, exactly, and I think that's probably those that in 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 Western contexts, those sounds or expressions that are now part of, I'd say, a global repertoire, not beyond the church, but a, a repertoire that people know and hear might work. And I think it's the challenge is how can it be deep and meaningful, not just yeah, ethno tourism, kind of yeah. how how is it yeah. a a real moment? There's a version of the Lord's Prayer that's in Arabic and Persian and Turkey and some guys from the Calvin Institute in the States have just translated that into English. And it's really? it's fantastic. I mean it's kind of I think it's got an A minor feel to it and yeah, it's really worth. I'd say if your listeners can check it out, it's a great version. Yeah, what would they need to look for? It's yeah. the Lord Lord's Prayer. Um, and I, I bet if you'd search Lord's Prayer, Calvin Institute, Middle Eastern worship, <laughs> original Arabic, and they've they've published it through their their publishing company too. That arrangement. And so brilliant. Um, it well, can we'll, be a real. I'll try and find that, and we'll add yeah. it add it yeah, to yeah. the notes That's that great. go with this. That's great. With this podcast, I sometimes think that. Um, in the same way that in order to translate a novel, you really need to be a novelist yourself. Mm. In order to translate a song, you need to be a songwriter so that you're able, because you can't just do it directly. And you've got to be able to create poetry and understand the song form and so on, haven't you? And, and I, th- I think the simplicity of, of the dominant song structures and lyrics that come from kind of the big, the big church movements are the ones that are quite quite easy to translate and yeah. in a sense that's there's a real strength to that that we can all walk in I, I think it was probably two years ago in a, a worship environment we do some extended times of worship in this gathering we sang how great is our God in about seven or eight different right. languages you know, yeah. and even languages where there's not a publisher so Kurdish and Turkish and Fantastic. things like that and so I think the, the challenges is songs that are much more poetic or even theological in nature are difficult yeah. to kind of import export. And I think that's that's too where that local expression is key. So thinking of your local church's um, yeah theology of worship and theology mm. of the world and things and 
how do we express that? And I think I'd, I'd encourage your listeners too. Don't don't just be looking for Chris Tomlin and Hillsong yeah, yeah. to define your theology of worship. Yeah. Actually, wor- work on that locally. You know, work on that with your own. That's pastors a really and leaders. interesting point, isn't it? Because you could probably argue that the simpler worship song, you you perhaps is more likely to be written on a local level. And if you want something that's more theologically robust and formative and so on, you might need to look elsewhere for people who've got the training and the, the skill set. So, but at the same time, it's then going to be harder to translate, either literally translate the language or just yeah. harder to translate into your context. Yeah. I, I think the, the, the other is the kind of middle ground is scripture and Thank God for all the Bible translators over yeah. the years who have translated Scripture, both in you know in, into different you know into different translations in English, but also in different translations in other and and so Scripture songs too. And I think probably one of the reasons for for so many of the kind of Vineyard and early Integrity songs and and Kendrick and others is because there was there was so much Scripture in there. It was quite easy to translate too. You yeah. look at. Psalms 20, you know, look at Psalms 23 in, in another language. And yeah. there's that structure, depending on how well the, the trans- <laughs> translators yeah. did. In fact, things. talking of Psalm 23, I was literally, just as I was preparing, I was, well, actually what I did was I went onto the LST website and, and I thought I'd just better get, get this right, make sure I get the job <laughs> title right. And what they do is they always list your publications. Yeah. And if you go on there, you discover that Jeremy's publications are solo sax performances. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> I'm I'm slowly developing articles and rewriting my my dissertation and stuff, but I quickly moved from finishing my doctorate to department head, and that that move, uh, yeah, my my research I've been been slower to get get out, but yeah, I mean, yeah, most most of my I've I've got a few worship projects or, or things yeah. out there, but most of my my publications have been playing sax yeah. and different projects and things That's like great. that. Yeah. That's great. I'm, I'm sure that's going to make you seem so much more accessible to, uh, to, to lots of people. But let's talk academia again. Um, obviously, because, you, you know, as a department head, you have to stay connected with what's going on. And, and just kind of the broader scene of um, worship studies in the academy. I'm just interested. What are the kind of what are the big themes at the moment? What are the big questions? What are the things that what's in vogue in terms of what people are talking about around the world? Yeah, I mean, I think identity is one, music identity, and folks like Mark Porter, Monique Ingalls have been researching that in the UK and now both both in other other contexts too in the States, and c- trying to understand, looking at, at worship sociologically and anthropologically, at wh- why, what is our culture of worship at a local mm-hmm. level, how do we define that? Um, why are things the way way things are sociologically? I'd say, you know, again, the last 20 years, there has been a lot of growth on in theology of worship and, mm. and starting to think more about that, where for years it was really the Orthodox, Roman Catholics, and a few few Reformed, you know, those from the Reformed tradition thinking theologically about worship right. and liturgy. And I'd say, say the last 20, 30 years, folks like, Robert Weber, even more modern, Lester Ruth, Constance Cherry, thinking theologically, Marvadon, others thinking theologically. And our, our students, we have MTH students and PhD students who are trying to engage with that. I, I think I've recently on my desk, there's books on Pentecostal theology of worship. And yeah. for I think that's quite helpful both for, for those from that tradition, but others who are taking songs from that tr- tradition to understand why they sing, you know, why they sing the yeah. things they sing and why is it important and why is experience and movement and body and I- important in 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 the midst of of song yeah what are we missing do you think in terms of academic research what you know what if someone came to you and said jeremy i want to get i've got four years to give i'm a brilliant um academic i could cover anything what would you where would you point them yeah i mean i think i think for again the lst constituency evangelical broadly would be would be that the th- the intersection of theology and worship um, specifically on I think on sung worship that's been such an important part of of the life of the church mm. of parachurch ministries um, and and lots of bloggers are quick to say well the, th- the theology of the last 30 years are rubbish but I think right. that that needs a little more thought in and of itself that critique but then also 
broader reflection on why it is that it is, because it it does reflect, um, you know, these songs reflect where people are at and their and their views and um, and so what kind of that why is it? And so yeah, some critiques, some some thoughts, some analysis, and I think something some things like that would be really helpful too, not just to the academy but to the to local churches, yeah. um, worship pastors, songwriters. Uh, it's an interesting parallel. I, I worked for a while with the um, international development charity, a Christian one, and there's a situation there where for there are sort of decades of practice, but only more recently work to try and say, can we actually theologically underpin what we do? You know, we're just trying we're trying to do what we think is the best thing, but have we ever actually had a theological reason for it? And I think you see similar things in worship, well, you see it across the church, but certainly in worship and in some of, in some of that charismatic worship explosion of the last 50 years and so on of all the Pentecostalism of the last 100 years we, we just we do it and then sometime later we begin to reflect theologically and often find that by the grace of God we've we've managed to follow some quite good theology even without realizing it yeah and at other times um it helps us then to move further forward because we begin to really understand what's going on well and I think these these movements aren't always um top down too in their their church structures so there's not uh you know a lot of these are new churches free churches um you know congregationally governed churches so there's not somebody at a head office somewhere saying here's our specific theology now go write write songs about this go express this it's actually more here our theology is expressed theology mm. it's embodied it's in our prayer it's in our preaching it's it's you know our doctrine is is that and I think we I think we have to realize that aspect too instead of saying well this this these songs don't express um, a full robust doctrine of the the Trinity and I would say you know that's that's a great blog you know you, you yeah. can read lots of blogs on on that well does our preaching does our prayer does does yeah. our does our Christian pop literature and I think to to just pigeonhole the songwriters doesn't recognize that these are probably larger issues but the cool thing is even groups like Hillsong and you guys in Resound you know things like that are are trying to tap in how can we how can we be more more trinitarian so yeah. i think these these discussions are getting out there and these topics are 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 getting out there but i think it's it's really important for also the academy and those who who are trying to reflect academically to to engage with it too yeah let's talk about the, just extending that in terms of how songwriters can engage with theology and do it effectively when it comes to their songwriting because you could end up you know they could come to LST they could do a degree and a master's and they can end up writing essays to music um I'm like yeah. I guess I guess that's not what we want although maybe occasionally it is I don't know how do you how do you kind of steer and help um people who are studying and learning theology to then translate that into songs which are going to be useful for corporate worship yeah, I, I mean, I think the uh, the ideal, um, which isn't possible everywhere for everyone, but yeah, the ideal is, can you engage within a community in some training together? You know, whether that is LST doing some online, or whether that's on a, at a local church level with your pastor, vicar, you know, or someone who who does have a an emphasis along with those who write and and engage musically and write harmony and things like that. So. The, I think the ideal is, is can you have a group that is walking together, learning together, yeah. but also writing together? Um, it sounds like a bit like a bit like what you guys try oh, to do. Oh, bless you. But, <laughs> but, but, and, and what we try to do with you know, students yeah. over a, a few years. But um, I think that that helps because, again, just you could go, I could say, you know, read Boltman or read, you know, read. Tom Wright, Surprised by Hope, by yourself, and mm -hmm. you might come up with some some great songs, but that's really you setting Tom Wright, and probably, again, doesn't reflect your church or your yeah. tradition, um, or reflects one aspect of, of, of a view, and so that's great. Um, studying, again, I'm studying scripture, and writing the Psalms are a rich, rich place, mm -hmm. and even in, in their entirety too, not just the two or th I mean, this, this has been said before, I'm sure, not just the two or three verses that are really <laughs> encouraging and happy, yeah, yeah. but 
the bits before that and the bits after that about about challenge and suffering and and yeah. a sense of loss. But and when that's pinned against hope, that's that's so you know a, a real hope filled with Jesus and the yeah, yeah. you know his his reconciling the the world. That that's such that can be such a powerful dramatic expression in in song or in, in preaching other other things too. So yeah, ideally within community, there some study, some reflection. And then really a localized discernment. How how does this does this song express our 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 theology? Does it stretch us? Does it challenge us? Does it will it also form the next generation? Will it will it be a song that um, is just for a moment and just a, a momentary expression, which can be very special and powerful? Yeah. Or yeah. or is this a song that we really want to say? You know, we we're, we're missing a view of of worship in every, you know worship in everyday life and we want to write a song that we could you know pass on to to our children and children's children yeah i love that you're talking about a kind of rootedness but which is quite a, is rooted in various places it, it it sounds so you you could say to the um to the local church song or frankly to any songwriter that you could do some better theology why don't you go away and study and they go and study, and then they start to write their songs. But actually, and that would root them better in some theology. Or it might, might, but you don't want to take the roots away in the local church, do you? Or the roots in their context or their culture, or, or the, and actually retaining all of those roots. And I, I love your your description of just the encouragement straight away. Do something together. So when you study, actually start studying and walk it, and, and think about how it applies to your lives as much as how it applies to your songwriting. And I, yeah, I think that's. That's such a, a key, and and for for songwriting for the church, I think it's it's different if you're an yeah an artist trying to express your own thoughts, your own feelings, which there's definitely a place for that in the church and definitely outside. But for those that are writing congregational worship, um, I think somewhere in the process, com- community has to you know community has to be a part of that process, and and. Theology has to be a part of that process. Discernment has to be a part of that process. Maybe a, a good word. Discerning your context and your your belief. What ma- if if theology is not a great word? You know, f- for some of you, if, what do you believe? What does this express? Who? Yeah. Or is it consistent with your beliefs? Um, and maybe your maybe it's not. And maybe your beliefs actually have. And that's why we have renewal and revival movements because sometimes our our beliefs need shaken up a little bit. We need to be stretched and go back to scripture and understand um, yeah. you know things like that so i think that that's a great model of you know of for, for congregational writing is getting the congregation involved people the people of, yeah people of god um yeah it's good stuff um Jeremy, sometimes they don't like your stuff, though, Joel. Sometimes who, who my stuff? The, the church, not your stuff. Not, <laughs> I'm sure sometimes no, they don't like they my love stuff. Your, no, they love your stuff. <laughs> no, but it, it is you know that that is a challenge. I mean, when when you begin to write, you know, in yeah. in in a community or even just bring that community in at some point, you know, the, there's going to be some misses and people. Well, I don't really like that, and I think we we also have to think about. Why don't they like that? Is that because going back to what we were talking about, transcultural song? Mm. The first time I had Masaman curry in a Thai restaurant, I didn't. You didn't like it. Didn't <laughs> know if I liked it. I didn't know if I liked it. I should, I, I should just describe Jeremy's face there. It was mainly, <laughs> it was mainly a physical answer. Peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and yeah, happy, happy meals from McDonald's. So. Yeah. The first time you experience something mm. that's new, that's that is like music or like food, that's so so deep within us that yeah. we don't always realize it, we might not like it. And I think songwriters trying to do new things or yeah. worship leaders trying to bring in songs from other, you know, other co- countries' cultures do have to recognize we're helping people um, experience something new, like a new meal. And I think yeah. if if you're like me from the Midwest, it was I was. You know, hadn't traveled a lot, hadn't eaten a lot of different foods. <laughs> the first time I had, you know, had it. But now I'd, I'd have that every night if I could. So I think, yeah, to understand that it is a process. Even when when bringing people into that, you're exposing them to a new, new taste. That's a great bit of insight. I was um, talking only what was it this morning, yesterday, to my wife about coffee, and about how 
when I grew, I don't know if it's the same in the States, but, but certainly when I was growing up, up until I was about a teenager, I think everybody had instant coffee. And then, um, and then I think perhaps, you know, I was 18 or something and I tried my first um, r- fresh coffee, yeah. you know, freshly ground beans. And I thought it tasted like muck. I thought it yeah. tasted like earth. I just thought, why would you, why would you drink this? And it's so funny because now I look back and I think, why on earth would anybody drink instant coffee? I don't get it because it's it's so shallow, it's so sweet, it's so. Whereas real coffee is rich and deep, and and you know those are all words I'd want to describe my songs or yeah. the songs that I sing, rich and deep and full of character and you know and overtones and resonances and all these things, and yet. Maybe that's quite a good comparison that in a church context or culture where you've been used to to, to any prevalent taste, be it instant yeah. coffee or anything else, yeah, yeah. even if I'm so convinced that if you just tried this, you would discover the depths of its complexities and the beauty. It's quite understandable for a lot of people just to say, yeah, I don't really like it. Can we just can we just sing the stuff we were singing? It's much better. Yeah. And that's why I think I think it's John John Whitfleet in one of his his books talks about that a balanced balanced musical diet yeah. of, of pulling in and so I think it's it's important that you may not dump five or six songs in a in a week that are are this extremely deep complex just like you shouldn't have five five shots of espresso in the, <laughs> in the morning you should, some of these things should be spaced out um, in the midst of other songs that are much more you know, expressive and uh, yeah. emotionally driven. I'm a good a good balance of that. And I think probably where I'm at just in terms of song selection is that of trying to still use some of these really dominant, expressive, exciting, passionate songs, but then bring in a... Uh, I was doing it this morning, just practicing for an event of taking Sam Hargreaves, Jesus, uh, lead, us to the, yeah. lead, lead us to the Father, just that bit, not the rest... Um, with no longer slaves and kind of connecting like this idea of the reason we're no longer slaves and understand yeah. our identity is because Jesus has brought us to the Father. Yeah. And so that that just, of course, I'm, that's I'm sure that in you know in in Jonathan Helser's mind when he's writing that, of course he's thinking about that and and as a part of his undergirding theology of who Jesus is. But by reminding the church that. Um, that that helps keep us trinitarian helps keep us yeah. trinitarian and so i think that can be a great way to to kind of express both the depth and yeah and the kind of heart yearn you know the yeah, heart yeah. heart yearns too yeah absolutely you mentioned very early on in the interview um the idea of formation as worship as formation as a, as opposed to worship as what experience or reflection or you just I say expand expression, that bit. yeah, yeah. Um, I think, and, and I, I value this, this is my tradition and still where I, I, I'm most comfortable is that like passionate, emotional, expressive moment where you hear God, you sense God, or you hear a word from someone else or hear the message and you respond immediately in, in the moment. And that expression, I think, does characterize the evangelical movement. You know, our hearts are strangely, strangely warmed, you know, Wesley mm-hmm. it, Aldersgate or or the broader charismatic movement of the inbreaking of the spirit in the service in the moment um, and that that is something that does form us you know the expectation that God can touch us move break in he's relational mm. but I think also the the lyrics probably is one of the key the lyrics or the words for worship is something that I think we can be more intentional about and that language forms culture language mm. forms expresses identity it definitely expresses belief um and so one of the things that i think we can be more intentional about is the the language we use in worship and that that does form um and also by critiquing the language you know looking back not just over one week but looking back over the last year or five years of our of the songs we've do- yeah. we've written or the songs we've sung and what what's the view of god in those songs what's yeah. the view of god's people what's the view of the world um what aspects of of theology or of the belief of the church aren't there and i think that can be a really helpful environment because if you only sing i'm a friend of god yeah you know i'm i'm amazing god loves me i'm special uh, 
for for a year, for two years, that that might be good, and that might be really important, and might yeah. be what God's speaking in church. But for forty years, or for uh, you know the the yeah. repertoire that would be passed on to the next generation, if they're only those I songs, those self absorbs that really only express who we are, we're we're missing out on who yeah. God is and who who the world is, and so I think. That's that's a real place for formation is thinking about the language. And then when we see those areas of lack of trying to to write into those areas, of course, understanding what where the church is at. But yeah. um, but but trying to do that. And I think that's we're starting. We're starting to see that more and more. And I think we've got a lot a long way to, to go. Uh, but I think that balance of expression and formation um, and and formation also helps yeah what's a it's not a popular term anywhere but it can encourage holiness and sanctification yeah it can, it can reorder our desires and the danger of worship that's only expressive is what if we're expressing a desire that's not, that's not part holy. of the kingdom yeah. it's not a holy desire um and i think i think i've probably been there i've probably expressed selfish <laughs> desires in worship yeah and that's okay it's real i'm sure yeah. you know there's grace forgiveness for that but um if that's all i express am i really being formed into the image of jesus week to week yeah. am i is the kingdom growing in my my life um and that's where it is good to sing some songs we might not like sometimes um, some yeah. songs that stretch us, some songs, um, yeah, sometimes that's songs of lament. Also, uh, Kendrick said it a few months ago when I saw him, songs of radical joy, rejoicing, and there's, there's, there's songs of celebration and dance, but just that really express the joy of the kingdom, too, in the midst of, of challenging times. Yeah. And so I think, I think those can reorder our desires, reorder our passions, which... Um, <laughs> if you knew me better, you'd know my passions and desires sometimes need reordering. So, I'll, 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 worship, worship can do that. Worship can help do that. The yeah. language, especially. That's brilliant. We had a comment on um, Facebook a couple of weeks ago, actually, from somebody saying, making some comment about where are all the songs of where are the songs of joy? Yeah. And that is a great, great question because the pendulum swings really easily, doesn't it? And I, and I remember um, Sue Rinaldi, um, who she looks after the Spring Harvest songbook, talking to her privately at one point, and, and she was saying that just oh, so many of the songs, almost all the songs are about the storms of life. And, yeah. and we've got, I've kind of find, in some ways, we've got this idea of lament now. We've decided, therefore, we can't have joy. Exactly, And, and yeah. the songs, which are just upbeat and joy. Why isn't it? Where have they gone? So we, we do that, don't we? We swing from one thing to another, I think. Yeah, and I, again, some of that is I, I, in in the midst of everything that's happening, I think some of that is also God's spirit reminding us of of these different things, and that we one of us catch sight of that at a conference, and then we, you know, encourage it for ten years and start yeah. to see it happening, and it's important in the midst of that to also say, oh yeah, well, this is this is joy. We are a, a resurrection people, and so then even 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 authors and researchers get into that so you'll, you'll hear them okay we were yeah. talking lots about substitutionary atonement and atonement issues now we're talking lots about um you know we're surprised by hope kingdom of god yeah, resurrection yeah. people those Absolutely. things so it's yeah it's i think it's what <laughs> it's what we do is this, evangelical yeah. renewal movements we yeah absolutely <laughs> jeremy it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you thanks so much for coming on um the yeah. podcast to talk to us and um i've got one final question this is the one that we ask all our interviewees um and it is this there's always for, for each of us there are songs that we come across where we think do you know i wish i'd written that i'd love to have written that song um, and we've been granted, you won't know this, but we've been granted the power to rewrite the annals of history <laughs> and, to, and to give you one of those songs. So I wonder, is there, can you think of a song which would you have that reaction to? I wish I'd written that. Yeah, uh, that, there's there's three or four. I, I, I think, if I can list off a couple, in, yeah, in, Christ Alo in Christ Alone, How Deep the Father's Love, I think singability is so important in those, but also the depth the depth of thought in that, that it does express something 
big, something major, something cosmic, but then also it's something very personal. I think that that tension and the, the one I mentioned earlier, I, even even just that one line of Jesus, lead us to the Father by the Spirit, yeah. help us help us draw near. And I think that's such a great definition of worship that that helps us understand that it is God's activity that that draws us and it is him who draws us into worship. That's brilliant. Well, I'll tell you what, um, Isaac Wardell has already claimed how deep the Father's love. So um, <laughs> you can you can have in Christ alone, and I think you can have Jesus leads us to the Father. Great. Um, unless, no, I think Geraldine might have already taken that. Looks like in Christ alone is yours. In so Christ you alone. That's not bad, is it? I've, I've we'll take that one. <laughs> four times last weekend, on we watched a bunch of well, live streams, you know, from the States during on a Sunday, and all four of them sang that. And so I think... It's, it's having a nice comeback, too, within the repertoire of the church. So that's great. Brilliant. What a song. Well, Jeremy, thanks again. Thanks so much for joining us. Great. See you, Joel. Well, that was Jeremy Perigo from London School of Theology. And we're going to finish, as usual, with our featured track, which this time is one of Jeremy's solo sax recordings uh, called The Benediction. Perfect for ending a podcast. We'll see you again at the beginning of February. Bye-bye.